We're going to start looking at a, a series of work holding methods and one of the first here we're going to take a look at is a three jaw self-centering or a three jaw concentric chuck. Um, this is probably the most common day to day use for the hobbyist uh, unless you're doing some specific operations. If you don't have this style of chuck I'd highly recommend that uh, this be one of your first acquisitions. It's uh, much easier than turning between centers and much easier than working on a faceplate. Uh, for a lot of applications. Now the reason it's called a, a three jaw is simply because as we can see it has uh, three individual jaws on it. Um, these jaws all move at the same time. As we scroll open the chuck we'll see that all three jaws move at an identical time. They're not individually adjustable so we can't move one of these jaws in while the other two remain fixed. This uh, device is primarily designed for holding round stock as well as uh, hexagonal shaped stock. So I'm just going to quickly open this up and we can drop a, a round in there. We can see that it's loose and as we tighten down the chuck um, it becomes secure. Now you'd want to use some uh, Tommy bars typically on this and uh, use those Tommy bars in these two holes such as this squeeze them together and that'll tighten that up a little bit more. Um, if you're working on larger pieces, doing that in a couple of spots can be beneficial. Um, it just takes some of the torque out. Now if you squeeze it in the opposite direction, as I just did there, uh, that will loosen the chuck and allow us to remove the piece. So the other shape these are really good at holding are hexagonal shaped pieces. Um, so a six-sided hex piece, uh, as we here have here, is just a small camera device that we can fit into there and then we can tighten those three jaws up on it and hold it securely once we get it properly centered. Um, this will work even for some out of round pieces as being the, the three jaw self-centering. Uh, you can think of it like a three-legged stool on, a, on an uneven surface. It'll, it'll find a, a fairly good level. Um, whereas a four-legged stool you might have one leg that's always rocking back and forth. Uh, so that's definitely something to keep in mind here is that the three jaw does give you that ability. Now you will see in some instances where people will chuck a square in the three jaw. Um, as you can see it's it's capable of doing it but this usually isn't the the best case scenario. Um, it is you can do it in a pinch if you've got a particular application that needs it. You have that option uh, but Often this isn't the best way just because the piece isn't as secure as we could ideally make it. We also have no way of adjusting it. Uh, so if we're trying to drill a hole or something into this, we don't have any easy way to adjust the, the location of that hole. But that is an option. So far we've looked at using this to clamp pieces on the inside of these jaws. Um, we also have the option, as you can see there are steps milled into the jaws and these steps can be used to hold pieces on their inside circumference. So I'm just going to use this little uh, bottle cap for an example. And that's now tightly held on there off the inside faces of the jaw. That's um, useful for if you're doing tubing as an example or if you have a, a workpiece that you've uh, made a depression in such as say this wheel here and you want to then hold this piece by this inside face while you do another operation you don't necessarily want to hold it by the outside for one reason or another um, so it gives you options to do things along those lines and as you get into larger diameter pieces um, you would simply go out to these other steps these these last steps are very very shallow I probably wouldn't use those for much work holding um, other than these first two sets of steps. Now with most three jaw chucks um, you'll have the option of replacing these jaws. So as you scroll this out we'll start to see that the, the jaws extend to where their teeth are outside of the the body of the chuck. Um, this isn't a very safe situation as it's spinning. You've now got this item to hit and catch. If you were to get anything too close uh, definitely the chuck becomes more dangerous there and you're, you're simply holding on fewer surfaces so your strength isn't as high so you don't want to extend these out too far but as we do extend them out 
we'll start to see how the chuck works. And that on the inside, we have these concentric rings like a screw thread that engage on the teeth of the jaws. Now the jaws can come out if we keep moving this out, that the jaws will eventually uh, disengage from that scroll. And they will disengage one at a time. So that one is out, that one is out, that one is still held in. Um, so we'd have to open up the chuck a little bit more uh, to, to get that last jaw out. So the scroll became a little bit tight as we moved out to that last step. Um, so I, I did remove that off camera there. And we have all three jaws out. Now, you have to be careful because these have to go back in the exact same slots. The reason for this is they are each a little bit different. If we set these two guys side by side and line up the bottoms, all we're going to see is that the teeth actually intermesh a little bit. They don't line up perfectly. Uh, this is so that the scroll will um, engage properly and they'll be centered properly. And each of the three teeth are set up in that way. You'll also see on the chuck itself lettering um, at each spot. So we've got an A, B, and a C. In some cases your jaws may also be labeled A, B, and C um, for easier identification. I don't see any identification marks on these particular jaws, so you simply have to go off of um, the teeth to determine which is A, which is B, and which is C. Um, for me it's easier to go off the back of the teeth, so here the, the A jaw has the largest offset for the first tooth, the B jaw has a medium offset, and the C jaw has almost no offset for that last tooth to engage. Now putting these back together can be a little bit tricky and that the getting all these to engage properly and to center properly. One other item you can do with these is depending on the, the model of the three jaw, it may have a separate set of internal and external chucks or it may allow you to simply reverse the existing set. So previously, these were mounted in this fashion for holding a piece internally with the primary gripping surfaces. I did show that it is capable to hold a piece externally um, with this other inside face. Now, we couldn't go very large there, but if we reverse these around, what happens is now we can hold much larger pieces both internally and externally on these jaws. So now when it comes time to reassemble the jaw, whether you're putting it back in um, the standard method as we took it apart or, or the reverse method as we're going to demonstrate here, uh, this is where the instructions really do come in handy because it can get a little bit confusing um, particularly with jaws that are that are designed for both inside and outside use, not dedicated um, internal and external jaws, so that you can use the chart and determine the order that you have to put these in on, um, because that is a very key item that we need to do. So this shows our first location should go in to the A slot, and our first jaw should be our jaw with the tooth that is the closest to the edge. So we're going to adjust our scroll to where that first thread is going to be near the A jaw. Going to move it out of the way. Slide our jaw on, which this A jaw is a little bit tight. And then while putting some downward force on it so that we make sure and engage it, we're going to turn that scroll. And our first jaw is engaged. Now it shows our second jaw is to be the B position, and it is the jaw with the tooth in the um, middle distance from the back. Again, I've adjusted the, the thread on the scroll so that as soon as we put that on, put a little bit of, of downward force onto it, and now that jaw is engaged. Then we just have our last one going into the C position, and it has the tooth the furthest from the rear edge. So slide that into place, a little bit of pressure to make sure we engage, and then turn the scroll. Now all of the teeth are engaged, 
And one of the things that we can look at now is the spacing. The spacing from this step to the edge should be equal on all of these. And as we spin it down and we come in closer to it being centered, we'll see that these are going to come together at the exact same time. And that's what we want. If these are coming in where one's coming in first and they're, they're not touching corners exactly, then we've put our jaws in the incorrect way. Now this is still a, a fairly small workpiece um, that we used on the previous demonstration showing that we could hold it in the jaws in the other manner, but here we can hold it with the jaws reversed. This um, gives us, with these particular jaws, gives us a few things. This isn't going to hold quite as tight because of the shape of the jaws, but the shape of that jaw also doesn't come down to a point as we see here. However, um, that shape is also going to reduce the marring a little bit on the workpiece, which can be an advantage. And then if we're holding a hollow shape, or a tube, or a ring, or another shape, I'm just going to use a uh, camera filter here for the example, and I'm going to hold it on the inside recess there. I'm not going to tighten it down very much, as I don't want to damage my filter. But now that is secured on there, and you can see um, through how the, the jaws are holding that in place. Now if we wanted to hold this on the outside diameter, we could loosen it. So I just took the, the manual out of the way just because it was kept sliding down. If we wanted to hold this on the outside, we could open those jaws up, place it like so, and then tighten it down. So this would allow us to work on a fairly large diameter piece. If this was a, a solid bar uh, such as this, but of a larger diameter, um, then we could easily hold that in there. This is probably as large as we'd want to go. That's even a little bit too big for this chuck. Um, you'd have to really be careful about the clearance of these jaws and whether they would impact the bed of the, the lathe. Also be, be wary because you're not engaging um, the last teeth on these jaws. Uh, and some of, some of them may not be engaging the last two teeth. So you probably really wouldn't want to do a piece this large, but you could do a piece uh, slightly smaller along the lines of that that diameter there. So that's with the jaws reversed. I'm going to go ahead and scroll these out again and remove them. And then taking a look at the instruction manual um, for placing the three jaw in their their standard locations. Um, we're going to follow those instructions. So our first jaw is going to be again in the A location but in this instance, the first jaw is going to be where our, our back surface is as far from the edge. Our first tooth is as far from the, the back edge. Um, on the opposite side of this, it happens to be that this front tooth is as close to the edge. So that's why we're loading it first. So put that in, put a little pressure on it, and turn it until it's engaged. And we're going to set the scroll for the next jaw which again matches up with the picture. Um, it's where the edges are more or less centered from the front and the back. And we want to engage that, which we've got done. And then, last, is the C-jaw. Now, go ahead and spin it down. And if we've put these in correctly, we'll see them come together at a point. Now just for a visual demonstration, I went ahead and took the jaws out and I put them back in pretty much randomly. And you can see that their distance to center is um, not concentric anymore. So this, this is definitely a situation we want to avoid. Um, if you're doing this frequently, you can also damage the chuck because these, these do kind of wear into their correct spots. Um, so you really do want to avoid this. You might look at this and think of, oh, well, this is a, a neat way that I can do some off-center turning, um, but this really isn't the solution you want to use for that. Uh, you don't have the control um, of where the location is at very well, and again, it, it will damage your chuck. So, and here is one other example of misalignment. In this case, I have put all the correct jaws in their correct slots, but um, the C jaw, I ended up moving the scroll past and catching it on the second round. Um, so you've got to make sure that you catch that that first starting thread um, at the correct time as well. 
Otherwise, you'll end up with a situation like this. This disassembly and reassembly, um, as you can see, doesn't take very long at all um, on a small chuck like this. And is useful if you really want to clean it out. If uh, you're getting a lot of metal filings or things like that inside the chuck, the best way is to disassemble the jaws and to clean out the scroll as much as you can and then reassemble it. It's also a good way to um, do a full lubrication and cleaning just in general of the chuck if you're just wanting to get lubrication fully in there. Take them out, lubricate everything nicely, and go from there. If you want to fully disassemble this chuck, which I'm not going to show on this video, if there's requests for it I'll show it in another video, um, you just simply use some snap ring pliers, I believe, to remove this snap ring, and then the jaw should come apart fairly easily.